Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to my home worm farming channel. If you are looking for a friendly, helpful vermiculture community, you are in the right place. Today, we are going to be looking in on my most productive worm bin. Blue, my 55 gallon barrel that was turned into a worm bin. Last time we took out 20 gallons of castings from this end fluffed everything up and then fed five gallons of bedding, four gallons of leaves, and three gallons of people food. So we're gonna go and we're gonna look through this and we're gonna talk about Blue and why he is the best worm bin I have. All right, let me get you put up on the rail and let's get looking at Blue. Okay, so here we are. Uh, gonna pick through some of these big pieces here and put them down at the finish end. Now, I don't think, I'm not gonna do a harvest today because we took out a third of the bin or a quarter of the bin last time in castings. And I'm not sure that this is gonna be done yet. So what we're gonna do is I am going to fluff up the bin here and see what we've got in the way of worms at the finished end of the bin here. And that will give me an idea if they're ready or not. And as you can see, I've got worms. I've got worms. Uh, in this part of the bin, which means they're not done with it yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get them some air, fluff things up here, evaluate all the big pieces, and if I find anything big that I don't think they're going to finish, I'm going to remove that and put that to the other end of the bin. And then we can get back to uh, fluffing the bin and seeing if we can't get something more out of it maybe next time. Alrighty, so this is one of this is the most productive bin I have, and I don't think it's just because it is the largest. I think it actually has a lot to do with the fact that it has a lot of surface area. If you watch my African Nightcrawler video, I have a Vermi bag, little mammoth, and that has about the same volume as Blue does, believe it or not. And I do not get near as many castings out of that as I do this. So, it's, to me, it's gotta be the surface area. I'll put a, a diagram of what blue is, but he's got a huge surface area as opposed to the overall volume. And I think that helps make things be faster. It probably also has to do with, there are a lot of worms in here. Blue has somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds of my Red Wiggler Blue Worm European Nightcrawler mix. And of course, with that much uh, worm power, you're gonna get castings way faster. Now, as we get into the warmer parts of the months, we're at 69 degrees here in the basement, which I think is 20 or 21 Celsius. And so it's getting, so it is definitely getting warmer here than it was the last couple of months. So I'm going to continue to increase my feedings until you know they get to the point where basically it becomes apparent that that is enough. Last time when we fed, or the last time we were in here, we did not find much in the way of food that was left, maybe a little bit. We found a little bit of the sweet potato ends that were dried out that I put in here. You can tell that some of the squash seeds have sprouted in here. Now some people ask me why don't I keep those and put those in the garden. Uh, well, number one, it's way too early here in zone five. Uh, then also in addition to that, uh, I did not try to keep the plants separate from the other squash, so God knows what uh, hybrid of squash that would be because they were all planted very close to each other. So th those are why I'm not keeping that and I'm still picking out plastic from those donated paper. I just saw a very s scary video from Gardening in Canada, and she was talking about microplastics and nanoplastics, and basically the uh, take home is everything's got nanoplastics in it now, and there's nothing we can do about it, uh, which is horrible. <laughs> I don't get freaked out easy, but when somebody who lives their life as a scientist tells me that there's really nothing to be done, that it's in the water and everything else, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. 
but it also, and in, in that makes me feel a little less guilty about accidentally having plastic in here because it's going to be in here anyway. Back to blue. We're doing good. You can see that there's still recognizable food and bedding here and lots of room or lots of worms here, even in the middle. So these guys are well fed and feel like they're definitely not in the mood to go anywhere, which is totally fine with me. Like I said, I wasn't expecting to get any kind of a harvest today. But when I do get harvests, they can be very huge, like the 20 gallons that I got last time. I do not get that kind of a, a harvest out of my vermi bag just because of the surface area to the total volume of the bed is simply smaller. All right, we're getting all the way to the middle here. Now, last time I gave them some leaves. I had a bit of a worm storm. Oh my God. Had a thunderstorm with a lot of wind and uh, I got a bunch of leaves blown into my area. So I collected up the four gallons of leaves and fed those to the worms last time. So I'm gonna see how they're doing. I don't think I gave them any food that's particularly long, long-term food, but I think that usually leaves take a couple of months to break down. All right, and I don't, put it in the comments below if you have experienced your worms ejecting things from your worm bin, things that they don't like. I often find stickers and little bits of plastic that have accidentally got into the bin move to the top and are just sitting there, right there for me to pick up. Uh, good worms. I'm assuming it's the worms. I suppose it could have been the isopods, you know, with their little fingers bringing things up to the top, but I'm gonna give the worms the credit. They get all the credit anyway, right? All right, let's move down to the feeding zone of the bed. Okay, you can see quite a bit of the paper here on top that was just shredded paper straight out of the shredder, but I'm also seeing a few of the leaves, so they haven't got through that yet. I'm gonna go and flip this over and see what we've got. Not a proper worm ball, but not bad, right? You can see a lot of the the grit and and stuff that I had put in there previously. They got an entire blender of eggshell and whatever food was in there. So they're definitely going to have more than enough grit for a while. All right, so we got leaves. Oops, oh, kind of messed up a worm ball. Here's a jalapeno that didn't make it and leaves and paper so we've got they've got a long ways to go with this particular part here let me keep keep flipping wait do we have a worm ball no but the leaves are definitely very far from being completed pretty sure put in the comments below if you use leaves and paper in your worm bins do you think the leaves take longer than yield shredded cardboard and paper I'm thinking they do. Mine don't get it very often, but uh, it looks as though they're going to take longer than ye old paper. Keep on digging here. Let's see what we got. More leaves. It seems like they got matted down. Maybe they're a little bit anaerobic. Got some hitchhikers here in my hands. But we'll get some air, we'll fluff it up. This is one of the reasons I really don't like using office paper, is it really sticks together. But if it is in the house, it needs to be turned into worm food, so that's just what it is. You will eat your paper. All right, I'm gonna stack this up and keep moving. See if we've got anything interesting at this far end. Because the bin slopes this way, uh, any extra moisture goes into this far end of the bin. So sometimes we can get a worm ball. So a little bit of a worm ball there. And you can see all the different kinds of worms here. You can see the European night crawlers with their vanilla tail and the red wigglers with their yellow tail. And then when you see the worm that is all blue, then that is the blue worm. 
these are all, they stay pretty small here in this bin because there's a lot of them, but they are mature. Most of them, I see cocoons all the time. Ooh, looks like we've got more of a worm ball here. Random piece of plastic that must've came in on the leaves, but we're looking good here. What is this? Ooh, I am gonna put this down so that you can see this. I have never seen this many mites in one place, ever. So I'm gonna put it down so that I can do a bit of a time lapse for you or sped up time. And then I'm also gonna wipe these off my hands. Okay, that's enough of the uh, mite TV. Uh, but when I would talk about how certain species tend to really have a population bloom, when there's food that they need to take care of, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I'm gonna put some of these big things down in the bottom before we give them their next feeding, including that potato. Now, generally a frozen potato is pretty decently fast food. Uh, maybe that wasn't frozen, I don't know. I don't remember, but I do know that the mites and the springtails show up when they're needed and the population kind of dies back when they're not needed. Okay. There we go. Got a good base there. Now let me get their food. And because there was not basically nothing but that one little potato left over, I feel very comfortable feeding them this stock pot full of food, which is about a gallon and a half or two gallons. And if they can't get to it right away, there is some pumpkin in here, some spinach, tomatillos, tomato, onions, more sweet potatoes, and a cap for some reason. Then I'm going to do the same thing I did last time and give them their eggshell, orange, carrots maybe. So they're gonna get that on top of their food. Also must be mint, I smell mint. And then we're gonna give them the rest of this bedding, which is about three or four gallons. So we did not fill it up with that much bedding this time. I'm gonna put a little bit of this on top to get the microbes in there fast. And then I do still continue to keep the plastic on top here to keep the moisture in the area that the worms are in. It's just a little bit too short for what I'd like it to be, but then I also will go ahead and put my plants back on top of this to hold it down. Look at all those hitchhikers on my hands. You live here, guys. So if any of you guys are into spicy food, this is actually a Jay's peach ghost scorpion. You can see how small they are. This is what I get for overwintering the plants. I get little tiny peppers um, and that's fine. I have found that they will bounce right back in the spring a little better if I don't make them go completely dormant. But I do reduce the, the volume of the plant and cut it back and then also don't water them as much. But then as soon as I stick that back outside, come June, bang, I am gonna get a ton of peppers super fast. Here is another pepper plant that you can tell is just going nuts. I will probably have to trim him back, but same story. These are not super hot peppers. These are like cayennes, but they will definitely go crazy and the plant will get much bigger come spring. All right, guys. Well, if you liked hanging out with me and my worms, give it a muddy thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, go ahead and click that subscribe button. And if you want to know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that little bell icon. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms. And everybody, have a good day.